My name is Christoph Pettis. I'm with a company called PostgreSQL Experts, and we'll be talking about um, administering Postgres when it's not your job. Um, who here has seen my previous two talks here in Argentina? Um, there, there will be some overlap, so you can go, you know, take a nap during those periods. But it's, um, but uh, um, there is new material here as well. All right. Um, so we are now in this world of DevOps, and you go onto Google and you look up DevOps, and what do you find? You find definitions like um, it's integration between development and operations. That sounds like a good thing. Or it's cross-functional skill sharing. Or it's maximum automation of deployment and development processes. What DevOps really means is we're way too cheap to hire real operation staff. And anyway, cloud. Cloud solves all problems. Just you use that word and problems vanish. It's amazing. Um, what this really means is in many companies, there's no experienced database administrator on staff. Um, and have you seen how much you have to pay those people? So no one wants to hire one. Um, and it, what it really means is developers are pressed into duty as database administrators. Um, how many people have had that experience where you walk in and say, just set up Postgres, it's easy. And then you think, you open postgresql.conf and think you're, and think, oh my God. Um, but it's okay, it's PostgreSQL. Um, for the one or two people in the room, um, PostgreSQL is a robust, feature-rich, fully ACID-compliant database. It's very high performance. It can handle hundreds of terabytes. The largest database I've ever personally seen running on unmodified Postgres is six petabytes of data. So Postgres does scale. Don't let anyone tell you it doesn't. Um, it's well supported by Python, Django, and all sorts of other stuff. And it's open source under a very permissive license. It's, uh, the PostgreSQL license is derived from the BSD MIT license. But then you hear people, especially people coming from other databases, they'll say things like, well, Postgres is really hard to configure, or it requires a lot of ongoing maintenance, or it requires really powerful hardware to get good performance, or it's SQL and that's boring and also it means it's not web scale, whatever that means. Or just elephants scare me. Um, so, and then you pop open PostgreSQL.com and it looks kind of like this. Uh, this is the control room of a Russian nuclear reactor. And you think that. Um, because there are 300 plus options in Postgres and you think, and every one of them sounds like it's really important and if you don't tune it just right, something really terrible will happen. And that's not true. It's really like this. You push the button and the database server turns on. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, this is my favorite example. This machine um, I bought in 1997. Uh, it's an old Dell server. It's running um, FreeBSD. Those, those were the days. Um, I think FreeBSD 4. Um, it's running Postgres 9.2.1, the most recent release. I spend about 10 minutes a year maintaining this server. Um, so your argument is invalid, whatever your argument. Um, so let's talk about PostgreSQL when it's not your job. We'll talk about basic configuration, some easy performance boosts you can give to your system, how to do ongoing maintenance in a way that won't require you to stay up till two in the morning. Um, we're not gonna talk about hardware selection. You can ask me sort of around about that, but there's so much to go into about hardware selection. And most people are running these things on virtual machines anyway these days, so you don't get to pick your hardware. So I'm, um, I'm me. Um, I started working with Postgres in 1997. Um, I've been working with Django since 2008. Uh, since I joined PostgreSQL Experts in 2009. Um, and if you go to thebuild.com, there's slides and my very infrequent blogging about Postgres and Python and Django there. And I'm at XOF on Twitter. So first, just so to relax everybody, it's actually really hard to seriously misconfigure Postgres. You have to go out of your way to break Postgres. Um, almost all the performance problems you'll run into are application problems, not you, you, one setting was 1.1 instead of 1.2. Um, so don't obsess about tuning. Do it once, get it right, revisit it you know, once every few months, but don't go crazy about tuning. There's a lot of material here. Um, I'm going to have to talk fast, even by my standards. Um, and I apologize that I don't speak Spanish. Um, so there's no time to explain, just do this. 
If you have specific questions at the end about why I give this advice, feel free to ask. But for the moment, just, you know, really, it works. Trust me on this one. So installation. The first rule is use packages. I used to build everything from source, like my proud ancestors did. Mm. But it's not, you don't do that anymore. Use build source. It integrates more, very nicely into the environment. Um, and it, may, it gives you a lot of helpful tools to start and stop and manage the server. It also lets you integrate with the, the way this particular Linux distribution works. The, distri the distribution packagers themselves, the people who do Ubuntu or, or Red Hat, do package it. They can um, Postgres for it, but it can be a little behind the times. You know, you, here we are in the 9-2 days and you type, you know, yum install Postgres and you get 8-4, and that's not so great. There are other repos, however, that you can add to um, your system that have up-to-date packages, so use those. Um, um, Martin Pitt, for example, manages Ubuntu, um, has Ubuntu packages that are right up to the date, uh, up to date. Uh, Devram Gundas um, packages it for the CentOS, Red Hat, Scientific Linux, all those guys. So, the first thing is, on Linux, turn off the OOM killer. It's a bug, not a feature. It's the, it's, it is the worst idea in Linux. It is unsuitable for server OS. Um, use ext4 or xfs as the file system. ext3 is your father's file system. It's old and in the way. Don't use it. Um, there are two kernel parameters you have to tune, schmax and schmall. Postgres will give you a very unfriendly error message when it starts up sometimes because you need to increase the size of these. And that's really what you, all you need to do for a basic Linux configuration. We're going to now let's talk about configuring Postgres itself. You logging, uh, resources, checkpoints, and the planner, and you're done. There are four areas of, of parameters you have to tune. You end up tuning about 16, 12 to 16 parameters in your PostgreSQL.conf, and just don't touch the rest, and everything will be fine. Really, you're done. Do logging first. The reason is logging will give you data that will help you tune the rest of the system. Be generous with your logging. It's actually quite low impact on the system. Um, unless you have an extremely busy system, you won't crush your system just from the logging. And it's your best source of information for finding performance problems. Your first choice is where do you want all these logs to go? Um, if you have a, sys a logging infrastructure that you like already, use syslog. Um, syslog is kind of a pain to set up. You know, I spent like four, you know, I've done it a bunch of times, and every time it finds a new way to make my life miserable. But once it's set up, you're done. It, it tends to work very reliably once it's done. Um, the other form is standard format. There's kind of no good reason to use this anymore. It was the original Postgres format. It is kind of nicely human readable, but I would really encourage you to use syslog instead, um, the, instead of standard format. Um, if you don't want to use syslog, um, if you, because you don't kind of aren't into syslog as a way of monitoring systems, use CSV format, because there's a lot of tools that can parse CSV format that can't parse standard format. So what do you log? Just set up this, just do this. Um, this is the, the destination is actually is the format for it, so this uses CSV log as an example. You could put syslog there if that's what you want. This is the directory they will go in. This turns on an automatic log rotator. This is the file names, how big the files could get. Um, this says any statement that takes more than 250 milliseconds to execute, log, very handy for performance monitoring. You want to log all the checkpoints, log the connections and disconnections, log all the lock weights, every, or every time Postgres waits for a lock weight over, um, by default, one second, it'll log this, and log all the temp files. Make sure, um, this gets you a lot of good information for tuning your system. So just cut and paste this into the end of your PostgreSQL.conf. So, and then you're done with logging. Shared buffers. Shared buffers is my favorite topic. Before I, I give, I'll give away the, the, the end of the movie there. Um, I once got a call from a client who said something like, shared buffers is set to six gigabytes on our system. We'd like to, should, would we get a big performance improvement if we set it to six, um, six gigabytes, 128 megabytes? Or some really small, and you know, there's, a, no. You will never notice in a million years a change to shared buffers that small. This is not a parameter you have to go tweet, 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 tweet. It's like this big ax you hit the system with. So 
here's how you set shared buffers. 25, you set, set it to 25% of memory, um, then workmem set to twice RAM divided by max connections. Um, work, um, workmem, um, so by default you have 200 max connections. So let's say you had a, I don't know, make up a number, um, a 16 gigabyte system, you div 32 gigabytes divided by 200 is whatever that works out to because since I'm a computer programmer I can't do math without a calculator. Um, and set work mem to that. Set maintenance work mem to 1 16th of RAM. And set effective cache size to RAM over two. If you were at some of my previous talks, I gave more sophisticated ways of tuning these. The, those more sophisticated ways are right, but I think the point of the exercise is don't obsess. These work just fine as, a first, as, a, as an initial setting for the system. And don't set max connections to more than 400. If you think you have to, for some reason, you need a pooler, and we'll talk about pooling later. Okay, and you've just tuned the memory configuration. Well, that, you know, tell your boss it took you all day. Um, so checkpoints. Um, very quickly, a checkpoint operation is when Postgres takes everything that it has in memory that's been updated and shoves it onto disk. For, um, it can be a lot of I.O. It's this I.O. spike bink, that happens. It happens when two, one of two events happens. A particular number of wall segments have been written, and if that sounds like I just said a particular number of don't worry about it, um, or a timeout occurs. Here's how you tune it. And you can do this without fully understanding the process. You just, it's very mechanical. Set wall buffers to 16 megabytes. There's no reason to set it to anything else. Um, set checkpoint completion target to 0.9. Likewise, there's no reason to set it to anything else. Set checkpoint timeout between 10 and 30 minutes. Basic, if Postgres crashes, not if you shut it down normally, but if it crashes, the higher this value, the longer it will take to start up, but the better it will perform while it is running. So it's a trade-off. Um, it will not take the, this full amount of time, so it won't take 30 full minutes to start up. It'll take about 20%, so about maybe six minutes to restart. So sort of set this on your, th your level of pain, how long you're willing to, for the system to take to re recover when it crashes. Um, busier systems will take longer than, than, fa than, than less busy systems. And set checkpoint um, segments to 32. Okay. Then you look at the logs, and you, get, you bring up your system and you run it, it's under normal workload, it's doing, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And every time Postgres ex executes a checkpoint, it'll write an entry to the log. And you can see, well, okay, it looks like it's doing a checkpoint every you know, eight minutes or something like that. If that's less than what you've set checkpoint timeout to, increase checkpoint segments. And don't increase it by a little bit, double it. So 32 to 64 and then run the system for a while longer and see what happens. And if it's now more than checkpoint timeout, you're done. If, after having done this, checkpoints are, um, uh, when you have a checkpoint, all the I.O. is being used on the system, you know, you type I.O. stat and it's all 100% utilization, you need better hardware. Because <laughs> you've, just, you've just determined you're, not, you're doing more I.O. than your system can handle. And that's it for checkpoints. Planner settings. People, there's like all these planner settings and people get really obsessed about them and they're all meaningless. Um, there are two you have to change, maybe three. Effective I.O. concurrency. You set it to the number of I.O. channels, which in the case of like a RAID 10 array is four. It's the number of disks, actual spinning things. In the case of an SSD, it's the number of channels, um, channels to the SSD. That's usually a multiple of 16, so it's 16 or 32 or something. Um, if you don't know that number, just leave it commented out and everything will be fine. Um, random page cost. Generally, for a RAID 10, you want about 3.0. If you're running on a SAN, uh, 2.0. And if you're running on Amazon EBS, 1.1. That number seems to work great. Why? Who knows? And you're done with I have I have an explanation. I'm not sure I believe the explanation, but I have one because I'm a consultant. I have to have an explanation. Um, and then you're done with planner settings. Okay, you've just tuned Postgres. And it really shouldn't take you much more time than it took me to tell you to do this, depending on how fast you run in VI. Um, so, that was easy. So here's some easy performance boosts. We'll talk about general system stuff, uh, stupid database tricks, don't do this stuff. 
um, SQL pathologies, um, indexes, one of my favorite topics, and tuning vacuum. Everybody's, everybody loves vacuum. It's the best part of Postgres, right? Yeah. Um, general system stuff. The easiest thing you can do to improve Postgres performance is not put something else on the, bo the same box. Don't run your web server. Don't run this gigantic memory sucking JVM. Don't run your, e your big email server. You know, don't run, you know, don't run anything related to JBoss on the same machine. This is the first you stop smoking, then we worry about everything else about your health kind of issue. Um, if Postgres is in a VM, and of course, most Postgres are these days, um, remember you're sharing that hardware with everybody else with every other tenant on that VM. If you're in a small slice VM, a bad neighbor can move in next door. You know, you're, everything's running fine on, on Amazon or something, and then Reddit moves in next door, starts throwing late parties, and you know, your performance goes through. So be aware of that. So don't do these things. If you are running a website, do not put your sessions in the database unless you absolutely must. It's an easy way to cut down the load. Put it in Redis or Memcached. Sometimes you have to put persistent um, data in, um, in the database, but you rarely do. So this is a, a really quick, easy performance boost. Constantly updated accumulator records. Um, I don't see this as much as I used to, but there will be one big record, like the number of visits today or something, that's being written and written and written and written and written. Very, very bad for database performance. Move that stuff to some other place, like a memory database. Task queues in the database. Celery is the worst offender here. Um, I love Celery, it's great. Don't use it for the task queue. Use RabbitMQ or one of the things that are, that are built to be a, a task queue. Or Redis. I, I love Redis, I think it's a great product. Don't use the database as a file system. Um, don't store giant things like images or huge documents directly in the database unless you absolutely must and you probably don't. Um, put pointers to them, store the file path in the database and put them over here. Django does the right thing by default, or things like that. Every modern computer ships with a built-in large object database that is optimized for this kind of thing. It's called the file system. Use it. Um, frequently lock singleton records. Um, these, are, these tend to be records like settings or system-wide preferences that are um, shared across the entire system. The problem is if you write them and somebody else tries to write them, you block and that's not good. Hurts performance. Very long running transactions. Keep transactions as short as possible. This, um, do, not use um, do not leave a transaction open while something asynchronous like a user interaction, a, a JSON API call, or something like that is going on. Close your transactions first. When you're, using, when you're bulk loading data, Use the copy operation, not insert. Copy is much faster in Postgres than insert. So if you're uh, um, inserting thousands and thousands and thousands of records, use the copy operation. Um, PsychoPG2, the, the Python interface for Postgres, the only one that you really need, should think about using, um, has a very good copy interface. Um, Transactional data warehouse queries, what I mean by that is let's take the classic example of an e-commerce site and people are up shopping and they're writing things and they're ordering stuff and all that. And then you do this giant reporting query because management says you have to at you know, two o'clock on a Friday when everyone's bored and they're shopping on your site and the whole system performance goes thunk. Um, you want to split these ideally into different machines. Um, by sample using replication or something like that to make a separate copy of the database. So, SQL pathologies. Gigantic ins. This is really typical in Django because Django makes this so easy where you have an in clause with like 5,000 members in it. Don't do that. Rewrite it as a join. Unanchored text queries. There is no index in the world that will speed this up. Um, you, if you want to do this, Postgres has built-in full text search. Um, use that instead. Um, small high volume queries, like you grab 20,000 records and then summarize them in the, in the application. Use the database to summarize this stuff. It's what it's there for. It does it very well. So if you're doing summarization, do it in the database and just get the result back. Okay, indexes, my favorite.
So what is a good index? What is a good index? A good index has the following characteristics. It has high selectivity on commonly performed queries. Selectivity means when you do the query, how many records of all the records in the table do you get back? If the answer is, very, is low, is, you know, you, it's, a it's a 10 million record table, you get one back, that's very selective. If you get half of them back, it's not very selective. Or it's required to enforce a constraint. Um, the, um, for example, the primary key has to have an index on it. That's okay, you just live with that fact. A bad index is every other index. If it doesn't have that criteria, it's a bad index and you shouldn't have it in your database. You know, um, for example, you know, I'm, you know, the, a, a very common thing to have in a database for people is their sex. You know, I'm from San Francisco, so that's an eight value field. Um, and, but most of them are male or female. So and a query on male will probably pull back 45% of the records. Don't index that field. It is faster to do a sequential search on the table. Um, there, uh, the index is non-selective. That is to say, when you do a query on it, you get back most of the records in the table, most being defined at about t more than 10 or 20%. It's rarely used. It could be an extremely perfect selective index, which you only use once a week. And it's extremely expensive to maintain an index on every single insert if you're only querying on it once a week. Or it's expensive to maintain like it's a complicated functional index. You don't see that much from you know, Python applications, but, they, but it can happen. And remember, if you have a multi-column index, you index on both A and B, you can, um, that only accelerates uh, queries that include A. It doesn't help you if the only uh, column is B. Don't go randomly creating uh, indexes on a hunch. When I create a new database, I generally create it with no indexes except the mandatory ones, and then just add them in as I need them. Anyway, creating random indexes on a hunch is my job. Um, the two tables in Postgres are PGStat user tables and PGStat user indexes. These are built-in statistical views in Postgres. Using PGStat user tables, you can show how many sequential scans there have been on a table. And PG user indexes shows how many times that index has been used. You can use these to find, th this one, you can find tables that might need indexes because there have been a lot of sequential scans. This one you can show indexes, um, tables that haven't been, um, um, indexes that haven't been used as candidates to be dropped. Okay, whew, deep breath, next push. Vacuum, Every, who, rate, just show of hands, who, who knows basically what vacuum is in Postgres? You know, that it happens at all. <laughs> well, it's Craig, but it's his job. Um, one person. Vacuum is a maintenance operation that Postgres has to run periodically to clean up um, rows in the database. Um, a full explanation of it is a, is a good thing for another time, but, let it, let's say, but just say it's a maintenance operation Postgres must do, there's no way around it, and it can um, take up a lot of time, um, potentially. However, the good news is there's a built-in process called auto vacuum. 99% of the time, 90 to 99% of the time, it just, do, it just works, and you never even have to notice it. Occasionally what will happen is you'll see the load on the database get really high, and auto vacuum is running. Um, this happens like, uh, especially after you've done a big update um, to a database. Um, there's a parameter called auto vacuum cost delay. Just keep bumping that up until the problem kind of goes away. That'll solve it 90% of the time. Don't hold long running transactions. I, um, vacuum is, is blocked from many of its operations if there's a transaction open on a table. So that's bad. So make sure, it's okay for the database to keep running. Don't think you have to shut it down or anything. But don't have tr transactions open for five hours. A little note about this operation vacuum freeze because suddenly this has appeared on many people's pro as a problem. It's really beyond the scope of this to talk about vacuum freeze, but the way the symptom is your database has been running fine for like six to 18 months, and then suddenly all hell breaks loose. And like auto vacuum wakes up and is grinding through every table doing this high IO operation, you think what has happened? Um, and the answer is it's doing a vacuum freeze operation, which Postgres has to do once in a while. Um, just, first of all, just put in these settings. This will, this will delay the, um, the, um, the, number, the amount of time, it will, this one will reduce the amount of work it has to do, and these will delay how long Postgres 
runs. These are, that's a billion, that's 500 million, that's 10,000. Catch me in the hole to explain why, these, why I'm suggesting these. Then, do a manual vacuum freeze at extremely low periods. So you can't keep it from doing a vacuum freeze, but at least you can control when it happens. My favorite time is Christmas Eve, like 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve, you know, in Western Hemisphere, no one's doing anything on a database, so. Unless you run, now of course, when the, first, the, the first time I brought this up, the very next customer that walked through the door was a hospital, and that's one of their busiest times. Because emergency rooms get, you know, Christmas tree accidents, I don't know, but. Um, so they kind of looked at me with this, you know, People are, people are always being stupid. There is no low slack period, so we had to do something else for them. But for most, for most sites, you know, that, that are driven by people's work, that's fine. Okay, so the system's up and running and you fix the vacuum problem and you fix the vacuum freeze problem and everything's great. Um, we'll talk about the things you need to do for ongoing maintenance. Monitoring backups, disaster recovery, and schema migrations. Monitoring, always monitor Postgres. Um, just about every problem that Postgres will exhibit, you can catch before it gets really bad if you monitor. At minimum, monitor, monitor disk space and system load. If you don't do monitor anything else, monitor those. Um, my rule of thumb is, I, is for the main data volume, I like to see the data volume to be no more than about a third full. The reason is, once in a while, especially disaster recovery when you least want to have issues, you need to make a full copy of the database. Also, empty disks run faster. It's nice to do memory and I.O. utilization. High memory usage in Postgres is generally a symptom of something weird going on. And high I.O. utilization is a good sign that you're running out of power on your, on your uh, hardware. One minute samples, you know, five and 10 minute samples don't give you enough granularity. Use Nagios, with, Nagios and Ganglia are the sort of the basic things I like to use. Um, there's a plugin called checkpostgres.pl if you go to bucardo.org. It's a plugin for Nagios. Um, it can monitor about 25,000 things of which about six are things you really want to monitor. But you know, if you really want to know, they're all there. You can generate great looking graphs. So backups. Um, out of the tin, we, uh, you know, in the box, we get PG dump. Um, it's the easiest way to do a backup. It makes a full logical copy of the database. You don't have to shut down the database while it's running. The database operates normally while it goes on, thanks to the magic of Postgres. Um, it's very low impact on the system, low to very low. Um, it makes a full copy of the database. Uh, the problem is once you get to the tens and hundreds of gigabytes, that gets to be kind of impractical on how much, um, so you need to do something else for, for it. Um, the something else is streaming replication. This was introduced in Postgres in version 9. Um, it's the best solution for large databases. Frankly, it's really easy to set up. Uh, so for any production database, I say just do streaming replication. It makes life much easier. It's very easy to set up. You know, don't pay me to do it. It takes like 10 minutes to set this thing up. Um, it makes an exact logical copy of the database on a different host. Make sure it's really a different host, though. Um, if it's a virtual machine, uh, make sure it's tenanted on a, on a different piece of hardware. This is not always obvious in the tools the virtual host provider gives you. It doesn't guard against application level failures, though, because if, you, if like, you log in and you do a drop table and then you realize, ooh, right, that was the production machine, not my test machine. Oops. Um, It'll just push the, that drop table across the streaming replication connection happily, and so you do still need something else to maintain backups. You can dump the secondary, if that's what you want, the, the copy that you're making, or you can make, um, or you can, um, you, you can do, there are, there are more sophisticated ways of doing it. Again, ask me later if you like. One of the nice parts is the replica, the secondary, can be used for read-only queries. So that business of doing, only doing reporting queries on a secondary, that's how you do it. There are these messages that you will occasionally get about query cancellations. Um, and this is really painful because I'll get a call from somebody and, and they'll be using Bucardo or Sloney or one of these complicated replication tools. And I say, well, why are you doing that? Why aren't you using stream replication? He says, well, we got these query cancellation messages, so we just spent weeks of our life setting up this alternative architecture when they could have tweaked one parameter and fixed the problem. Um, increase this parameter max standby streaming delay to about 200% of the longest query execution time that you're going to be running on the server, 
and the problem will be fixed. This has consequences because, it, because while the query is running, the, the replica is not being kept up to date with the master, and then it catches up when the query finishes. So if there's a crash right then, the, query, the, the, rep, the stream replica could be farther behind, but generally it's not a problem. And you can dump a replica, so you can offload that dump work if you want. The downside of streaming replication, it's all or nothing. It makes a complete copy of the entire logical Postgres cluster, including all the databases in it, all the tables, everything. It's all or nothing, you can't choose. If you need partial replication, or you need a writable secondary, you need to one, do one of these trigger-based things like Sloney or Bucardo. These are tricky to set up. They're, they're tricky and they're fiddly and they have to be monitored closely. They're not part-time jobs. So for those, you probably do want to hire me to do it. Um, there's, another way, this, you, there's another way of, of archiving Postgres, of doing this kind of continuous backup. And this used to be, before version 9, the only way you could do it, and it was called wall archiving. You can do a base backup and wall segments. Basically, you're doing a snapshot of the database, which, and that snapshot doesn't have to be consistent. It can be, you know, CP dash capital R, you know, just a file system level copy, and wall segments to a remote server. You can use this set of information to do point in time recovery. So while you can't turn back the clock on Postgres, if you have a, let's say you have a snapshot that was taken at midnight and a bunch of all segments and now it's noon and somebody did something stupid like roll out a new version of an application that crushed everything, you can replay it, you can take that base back up and the segments and say, I want to replay until 11.55 p.m. It's slightly more complex to set up, but it's well worth the security. Generally, for a big production system where people would be very unhappy if the data went away, we suggest doing both streaming, um, stream replication and wall archiving as a three, as to, uh, sort of a three-point solution. Think of a tripod, you know, very stable. So very handy. So something's gone spring on the server and you want to do a quick diagnosis. Of course, this is an endless topic. I could do a three-hour talk just on this. But first, learn to use this PSQL, the command line tool for Postgres. Um, it's very handy because a lot of the time, you can't get in with a graphical tool like pgadmin3, but you can log in with the shell. There are two, the, the two most interesting system tables for diagnosis of this are pgstatactivity and pglocks. PG stat activity tells you what each current session that's connected to the database is doing and shows you the text of the query it's running. PG locks shows you every lock that's being held in the database. You can bounce, they, they both have the process ID of who's holding the lock or waiting for it and who's doing what here. By bouncing back and forth between these, you can figure out who, um, who is, what the process that is holding the lock is doing that everyone's waiting on, and that's very handy. Just cycle back and forth between these. Boing, 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 boing. Um, so here are some pitfalls you can run into. Oh, vacuum freeze twice in the same talk. Um, character encoding. When you create a database for the first time, the, the character encoding is fixed. If you build it from source, the, the problem is it's up to the packager or you what the default is. For example, Ubuntu, use, the packages used to um, initialize the database as SQL ASCII, which is not what you want, especially in a country that has meaningful diacritics in its main language, like Spanish. Um, fortunately, now that's been fixed. Now the default is UTF-8. Just make sure it is, because the problem is, once you've created the database, the only way to fix it is to create a new database. And migrating from, a SQL, from, a, um, from one character encoding to another can be pretty complicated if people have been putting garbage characters into it. So once it's been created, make sure you <clears throat> the character encoding was right. Sometimes C locale makes sense because it's faster than UTF-8, but again, in a language that, that has meaningful diacritics, utf is the right answer. <clears throat> so who has done something like this? You add a column to a large table, you push it out to production in like South, it's a Django migration tool, and the production system falls over as Postgres appears to freeze. Trust me, Postgres is not crashed. It just looks that way. I've um, heard about this happening. Um, schema migrations. When you modify a table in Postgres, it takes an exclusive lock on that table for as long as it takes to do the modification. But 
you think, well, that doesn't take that long. I mean, it just has to update one little system catalog and it's done. And you're right. Unless you've added a column with a default value, at which point it has to rewrite the entire table. 65 million records, that could take a while. It can be very bad because it's holding an exclusive lock on that table. No one else can do anything to it. And if that's a, the main, if that's a very critical table in your system, the system will appear to have frozen. So how do we fix this? When you add a column to a big table, create it as not, not, null. I apologize for the way this is, fro as, um, is, is written, but basically make sure there isn't a not null clause on it. There is not a not null clause. Then add the constraint once the table is, the field is fully populated. It takes, that takes a lock, but it takes a faster lock. And the other option is you can create a new table and write all the values into it and copy the values into it. Um, but you have to decide how you're going to handle new records that are being added to the old table while that copy is going on. So occasionally, you log in, now that you're all um, master DBAs and you're logging in using PSQL and you're type looking at PG stat activity, you'll, you'll sometimes see something that says idle in transaction as opposed to just idle on a session. This is a session state where the, where the session is idle. Nothing's going on. It's connected to the database but hasn't told it to do anything. But, the pro but it's not doing anything, but it's inside a transaction. So what, uh, gen if you see a lot of, uh, you'll see these transiently all the time because you just happen to like look at it at exactly the wrong moment or the right moment. But if you see a lot of them, as you sometimes will with a Django application, it means there's an application bug or a pooler bug or something bad is going on. If you see, like, you know, you log in, you see like 12 of them and they, they've, been, they've been in that state for a while. And, and you should never see this state except transiently and, and find out what's going on. Idle in transaction connections are very bad because they can block auto vacuum, they can hold locks. So if you see these on a regular basis, um, then um, it's a bug and you should track down where that bug is. Uh, that check Postgres, um, Postgres plugin will monitor for idle in transactions. Um, yeah. Same thing I just said. <laughs> okay, so some additional tools you may want to look at. Um, for setting up streaming replication, look at repmanager.org. There's a set of tools to make setting up and maintaining stream replicas easier. It's very nice. If you're running on Amazon, um, check out Wall E from Heroku. Um, it's a set of tools for managing snapshots using EBS. It's very nice. It's one of the nicest things about running on Amazon is the EBS snapshotting capability. Um, there is a tool called PG Badger, which is a log analyzer. It sucks in those big text logs you're generating and generates really nice, pretty HTML reports. You can set it up to run as a cron job every night and email you the report or something. Um, we didn't talk that much about pooling because it's a little more advanced topic. Um, if you need pooling, which you will need if you want to have more than about 300 to 500 connections, uh, look at this tool, PG Bouncer. It's actually really easy to set up. It's a front end tool that sits between the client and Postgres and receives connections from it. Um, and so and multiplexes them down. If you're running a Django application of any size, you need PG Bouncer. Um, and there's my personal blog. There's my company blog. And questions. Everyone completely mowed down by. Um, historical reasons. The, uh, the basically, the dis the default settings are intended that you can boot up Postgres on a circa 1997 laptop without anything bad happening. So it doesn't over try and allocate a lot of resources or things like that. But there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of people um, who think, well, you know, kind of the future is now and we should move them forward. Um, and some of them, and the, the general trend in the project is actually to pull settings out of the file because, you know, so that, because there are all these buttons and knobs and if the, the answer to setting a button or knob is never ever change this in a million years, why is it even there, you know? Nobody has a timing advance on their car dashboard anymore, you know, so. Okay. 
Okay, thank you.